back, guys. Um, good to see you. Wow, that is really kind. Like, no, just... Woo, okay. Um, good morning, church. Welcome back to the building, or if you're joining us online, welcome there as well. Um, I'm fresh off of a week of high school camp, uh, so uh, please forgive me when, I'm, when I mix up my words and I say the wrong words. Uh, we had over 150 students and leaders come with us this week to high school camp, and God worked in some amazing ways. Yesterday, I know over 100 people went to Beginner's Day camp. Um, so first, to start off the sermon, let's just watch this update video from Wayne and Penny. Hey, Northside. I am with Penny Cox, general manager here at Maranatha Bible Camp. We are here at Northside's first session of high school camp. We've already had eight baptisms. God has been doing some incredible things. And Penny just wanted to take a moment to share some things with our Northside family. Northside family, thank you so much for your investment in the ministry here at Maranatha Bible Camp. We are on pace to set record for camper enrollment this summer. We're so excited after last year's year of COVID and how sad that was just to see campers back and just being healed from all of the uh, uh, time of being isolated and, and being alone and stuff, and God is just doing amazing things. So thank you for that. We also just want to thank you for some specific things. Thank you for the fact that you allow Wayne to uh, be the chairman of our board at the best time here in the camp, that uh, Kevin and Garrett and others on your staff are invest as teams, and, as, and then other staff like Tiffany and, and John are coming out this summer to be speakers and things like that. We're just so grateful. Uh, for all of that. We're also grateful for the investment of your own personal labor that you put in. You folks came out, your homeschool kids came, they cleaned up the center circle and uh, got things ready for Junior Bash. The staff came out, did a work day, and many people uh, joined them. And there were just so many projects that were on our uh, to-do list, want to get done list before summer camp, and you guys just made quick work of it. Our fireplace room looks absolutely beautiful. Uh, the, the wall here on the stage has been painted with just I can stay in here all day long and talk about the projects that we've done. And then just the way that you have financially supported us, uh, overwhelmingly, with the, the grants from the Missions Committee, we just recently uh, converted the bathroom uh, next to the kitchen into a laundry room. A uh, huge time-saving uh, convenience for our kitchen staff. They're so grateful. And we are just blown away by your Easter offering of over $23,000. Thank you so much for all that you've done to make this ministry thrive. And thank you for being a part of it. We love you. Awesome. Isn't that incredible? Uh, by the end of the week, um, we had, I think, if I have this right in my head, which who knows if I do, but we had 17 baptisms last week at the high school camp. So uh, amazing to see students coming to know Christ at organizations like Maranatha Bible Camp. And so we are so grateful to you as a church for partnering with us in giving to organizations like NBC. Um, not only your financial support, but as Penny was talking about, a lot of you have put in a lot of hours at that camp. Um, she always says, it's, it's not our camp, it's the church's camp. And uh, we have definitely loved partnering with them. So if you'd like to contribute uh, through giving to the mission of Northside, you guys can do that online at northsidechristianchurch.net slash give. Um, you can also do that by texting the link. Um, or you can, there are boxes around the room as well if you brought your offering here today. Um, thank you guys for partnering with us in that. Um, I can just tell you firsthand that money is going to a great place and lives are being changed, so thank you for that. Um, if you don't know who I am already, my name is Garrett Hawley, and I get to be the middle school minister here. Um, for some reason, they let me come again <laughs> and talk to you. I don't, it's not in my job description, but I, I don't know what, why they did, but um, I'm glad to be here with you, but really, the real hero is uh, a lady named Annie Roberts, who's teaching for me down the hall in the middle, and the leaders that are crushing it in the middle today to make that happen, so shout out to her and the volunteers making that happen. Um, we're so excited about what's happening there with our fifth through eighth graders, so thank you guys for also supporting that. Right now, we're in a, a series, oh, we've already started, guys, a series inspired by a book that changed the way I thought about friendship. Um, it changed how I viewed friendship by using word pictures like the four-lane highway or the concentric circles that Wayne has talked about in weeks past. Um, it changed the way I thought about affection between friends and affirmed some of the friendships I had come to know. It also, uh, if you've not read this book yet, I encourage you to get it because at the end of every chapter are really practical questions to help us assess 
how we're doing with friendship in our own lives. So it's called Made for Friendship by Drew Hunter. Uh, I'm using it heavily today. So <laughs> if you've read the book, you're gonna be like, that's all in the book, and it's true. Um, but today I'm gonna tell you a little bit of my story, um, and then we're gonna take a look at what cultivating friendship looks like from this book, but also from God's word. And I'm gonna include some insight from some of my friends along the way. So here we go. Um, I read this book in a time of transition in my life. Uh, Made for Friendship found me in a season when almost all of my friends had moved away from where I lived. I was about to move back home, but wasn't yet. And life didn't look like I thought it would, right? Have you ever been there? At, at, at the time, maybe you haven't been like this, but I was a children's minister for elementary age kids, which I loved, and I loved the church, but I didn't plan on working at a church. See, I have a degree in intercultural studies, so uh, I thought my life was going to be adventurous and exotic, and I lived in Joplin, Missouri, all right? <laughs> And all that aside, um, I was at a loss of what my life was supposed to be like. And I'm going to be a little honest with you guys today. Church, I wasn't raised to be a single man. Uh, I don't remember a single time being told by either extended family or friends here at the church that it was really good just to be single. At least not in a way that stuck with me. Maybe somebody mentioned it, but I don't remember it. Um, I heard a lot of sermons about marriage and about being a parent but I didn't learn how to be a single man. So I, I was raised to kind of follow a certain plan. And I remember this is, this is, I love telling this story. So this person might be here right now and I love her so much, but I told one of my spiritual grandmothers when I decided I was gonna drop out of MSU and go to Bible college, I told her that she's from this church. Her immediate response was, oh, you're gonna get married. <laughs> and you know, I didn't. Uh, and I think she meant it as like a compliment, like, oh, someone's gonna snatch me up, but they did not do that either. Um, and uh, don't get me wrong, like I tried really hard to get married at Bible college, all right? Like I tried really hard, it just did not work out. Um, but no one had shown me a way to have life to the fullest without first having a wife and then starting a family. So please hear me, I think that this omission of how to faithfully live as a single person, I don't think it was on purpose, but simply out of just ignorance. It didn't align with both societal influence and then this Christianese culture influence that emphasized romantic, finding your person, the sexual, the normal. And I'd hear occasionally that somewhere in the New Testament, Paul talked about being single and it being an okay thing. And, uh, but it was always in the context of kind of throwing single people a bone, you know, more like a, they're there, right? <laughs> and uh, maybe not on purpose, but that's how it felt. Um, almost more of a, they're there, or like, it's not a viable option for a Christian to live a faithful life single. And it left me with a sentiment that is best described by this quote from Leslie Nope, who's a character on Parks and Rec, which is one of my favorite shows. Every time a couple gets married, Two single people die. <laughs> it's a special shout out to, to my friend Serena Lynn, who is a Parks and Rec fan with me. But uh, so uh, there, was, there I was a few years ago with this sentiment, struggling to understand how to do life on my own. I was at a loss, which is ironic because the church was founded, grown, developed, and empowered by one who lived his life as a single man, Jesus. Not to mention the single men and women who followed him who started the church and grew it and took it throughout the world. So throughout today's message, I'm gonna be throwing in some experience and advice from some of my friends who are single and a part of the church. To start off, my friend Ben, who is single and he's a minister at a church in another state, reminded me that another professor of ours, who also was single at the time, told us to find a church where being single doesn't mean being alone. And Northside, we have to be a church where all of us can have friendships. And that means being a church where single people doesn't mean being alone. So this book came at a perfect time for me. It not only taught me that there was affection and love and deep relationship available through friendship, but it helped me to know how to navigate that. It helped me understand what I was aching for and what I had found in a few friendships during college but were harder now. It also taught me to understand that friendships change over time. 
Different seasons of life mean different levels of closeness, and really only a few people need to be as consistent in the way that we wish all friendships could be. This book opened my eyes that life could be full and fun and faithful without having to fit the mold I'd unknowingly been given. Now, in weeks past, we've talked about a lot about why friendship is important. And so if you're not convinced at this point that friendship is an important part of Christian life and that God desires for us to have meaningful friendships, then you're probably not a good friend. Dr. John Perkins, who is an incredible man, I hope you look him up after today's service. He has been devoted to civil rights and racial reconciliation and community development within the church. He said it this way, very simply, Christian discipleship is friendship. See, the original disciples were Jesus's friends. And he's right. To be a disciple is to be a friend of Jesus, a friend of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you've been sitting through this series thinking, this is really for those other people, um, that tells me you're probably not taking your discipleship seriously. And if you're not taking your discipleship seriously, you're probably not taking your faith seriously or your relationship with Christ seriously. So let's all be convicted that we have to grow in this. It's not just some of us or the single people or the married people with kids who don't have time. It's all of us. We all need friendship. My friend Sylvia, uh, who's single, put it this way. Since I was little, the importance of romantic relationships have always been emphasized. I used to think of finding that special someone as the epitome of all relationship. And of course, romantic relationships are a blessing but I'm learning that they're not the goal and they do not replace or surpass the need or importance of friendship. These next few weeks after today, Wayne is gonna be walking us through deeper friendship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And these will be really important and life-changing weeks for us if we let them be. So please make, be, make being here and listening to those a priority. Today, however, we're spending a little more time looking at our friendship with each other, okay? Today, we're talking about how to cultivate friendship. So in this book, Drew Hunter describes the first time his family decided to be gardeners. Maybe you guys have done this too, some of you that aren't farmers. Um, and they built the little bed in their backyard. It talked about how it took several years before they actually felt like they were actually good gardeners. Um, it took knowing how to, um, it took the experience of failing or learning and having some wisdom, right? It took the work of upkeep and correct watering and all those different things. And it also took knowing to adequately weed the garden before they were really good at it, before they had a good harvest. So today, uh, that's what metaphor he uses in the book to talk about cultivating friendship. And so that's where we are today. But cultivating friendships, good friendships require wisdom, work, and weeding. There's the three W's, all right? You can remember it. Wisdom in our friendships will require some self-examination, which is another aspect of our discipleship. So if you never take a look at yourself, come on guys, all right? We have to be honest about how we're doing when it comes to how we value friends. And Drew Hunter calls it giving your friends a promotion in your life. And some of you guys, you're parents of little kids. Uh, others are busy with work. Maybe you own your own business. You're constantly on call. Others are like, I'm just trying to get my kids to school on time during the school year. And right now they're home all the time and it's driving me crazy, right? You're, I, I understand balancing family, work, and trying to also rest, which is also a command. That can easily eat up our time. But where does that leave friendship? So honestly, some of you are too busy to be good friends. Friendship suffers because you don't have time for it. Rather, you've made, not made it the priority it needs to be, and so you're reaping what you've sown when it comes to friendship. If this is you, just consider how much time you spend on entertainment every week. Maybe you like watching Netflix, I do. Or you like watching sports, I don't. Or mindlessly scrolling through social media. My goodness, Instagram is the worst for me, right? I can just keep going. For anything to become a priority in our life, though, it takes a sacrifice of time. But this doesn't mean that we need to have everything together to invite a friend into our lives, right? One of my best friends has been in full-time ministry for several years. He's a single guy. This is what he had to say about being invited into that busyness. Single people need real moments and real days with real people. That sounds deeper than I'm trying to be, but it's just true. I don't need a polished dinner at the Smith's once every six months. I want to feel like I'm in the middle of the chaos. I'm still welcomed in, if that makes sense. So hear me out, if you're busy, fine. 
then invite a friend into it to go get groceries, to make dinner, as you work outside on your lawn, normalize doing life with friends, not just being less busy. Another thing wisdom asks, asks of us in friendship is that we consider our friendships when we decide where we go or where we live. C.S. Lewis has a great book called The Four Loves, and if you've ever read it, you know there's a chapter about friendship. And if you're wanting to dive even deeper than this book into what friendship could be in our community, I recommend the four loves, but he also had such a high view of friendship that he said this, if I had one piece of advice to a young man about a place to live, I think I should say, sacrifice almost everything to live where you can be near your friends. I know I am very fortunate in that respect. When we are making a big life change, consider, we usually consider our families and the financial implications, right? Those are the top two. But what if we elevated the value of friendship so that to see how this affects who we are close with, who we're driving in that leftmost lane of the highway with. Sometimes we don't get to decide, right? Life happens, we have to move, we lose a house or whatever. But in our individualistic society, we often just abandon our friendships to fit our most immediate desires. And so another part of being wise about friendships is this, be realistic. You cannot have a lot of very close friends. And if making great friends takes time, then we have to understand that we only have a finite amount of that to give anything. So while we need to make friendship a priority probably, don't be foolish with your expectations. One way to do this is rediscover, or discover for the first time for some of us, the value of acquaintanceship. It's a long word, but being an acquaintance with someone is not an insult. We can value those that we like, but we don't know very well without pretending they're a part of our innermost circle of life. Our culture, we bought into this lie when we started friending people on MySpace and Facebook. At least MySpace had your top friends, so everyone knew who was the coolest. But there is nothing wrong with being honest and realistic. Listen, if you're friends with me on Facebook, I want you to know this right now, just out of me being honest with you, I probably unfollowed you. I follow like four people, the people that are in my inmost circle. And it's not because I don't like you, it's because I don't need to fall into the lie that I know more about you than I really do. It's, it's not an insult. We're friends on Facebook. I would rather just see you in person here and talk to you. We can love our acquaintances without pretending we're more than that. But wisdom will also look like us understanding that deep friendships are sacred. It's true, we don't make vows with our friends. Drew Hunter in his book says, we don't slide friendship rings on our fingers, right? But David and Jonathan did make a vow. Ruth made a vow to Naomi. And while we may not make friendship vows or be super serious about it, we would do well to understand the sacredness or the weight that comes with friendship. In Psalm 55, verses 12 and 13, David is talking about how much our friends can wound us. He says this, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But as you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend. See, true friends recognize that when we allow a lot of people into our lives and souls, we're opening ourselves up to a lot of hurt. And we must be wise with who we choose to bring in close. The last piece of wisdom advice that Drew Hunter gives for friendship is this, flexibility. Like we change lanes on a highway, life has seasons to it, right? We may see someone in our left lane, but to them, we're really in their right lane. We may need to adjust. We may need to be open to being closer to someone who sees us as closer than we really are. Not all people you know that are your friends need to be your BFF, all right? Some people won't be your friends a few years from now. That's just how it is, and that's okay, because life happens. And if we're not flexible with our friends, we hold them to impossible expectations, and guess what? We fail to live up to those too. So be flexible. Understand friendships are sacred relationships. Be realistic. Count the cost of big life change on your friendships when making big decisions. Make your friends a priority. These are the things of being wise as we cultivate friendship. But we also need to do the work 
to cultivate friendships. So what does this look like? So like most of my friendships, I don't know about you guys, have begun pretty effortlessly, right? Like we have a similar sense of humor. Maybe we have a common experience and a life-changing experience together. But none of my friendships have lasted because of those things. Drew Hunter offers four practical ways to put the work into friendships. And the first is this, talk face to face. There are so many places throughout the New Testament that Paul and the other authors of the letters mention a longing to see the audience that the letter they're writing to. A letter will have to do for now, but there's nothing better than being with your friends. John ends his letter, 2 John, this way. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. So what if your friend is far away? Well, we have literally no excuse to not use the tools we have today to stay close. Whereas the majority of humans throughout history had simple letter writing every once in a while, if you were literate. But we have so much technology that if leveraged correctly, we can really help us. So these are two of my best friends. Um, this is uh, Micah in the middle and Nick on the right. Um, we don't live in the same place. Nick and his wife currently live in Guatemala because they're studying Spanish uh, to work with Black Box International to care for boys who speak Spanish. And Micah is a minister in a church outside of St. Louis in Illinois. It's just not possible for us to be face-to-face like we wish we could be. But I do my best to Marco Polo, which is an app, if you don't know what Marco Polo is. Come on, guys, let's get along. Uh, Marco Polo, Nick, every few days, which is just a video message, okay? And we text each other almost every day, and I'm doing my best to save my money so that later this year I can go visit them in Guatemala and see them. And Micah's the same way. We send each other funny videos on Instagram, and we message each other at least every week. When it has been too long, we call or FaceTime. We try to see each other every few months, but we also understand that life happens. These guys help me keep my head on straight. Without their laughter and their encouragement, I would not last in this job. I wouldn't last in life. But how lucky we are to be able to call and text and FaceTime and even joke together even when we can't be face to face. But this brings us to the second part of putting the work into friendships, which is to do things side by side. This requires us to do things together. We have to get together when we can and live life together. I have to care enough to drive to St. Louis to visit Micah and he has to care enough to drive to Springfield to visit me. I'm just, I'm having to sacrifice things so I can afford a plane ticket to go see Nick in Guatemala. But that's what it takes to be with my friend. It's worth it. Drew Hunter said it this way. He said, friends do things together. It's not complicated. And the best part of friendship is not the doing, but the being. When you're with good friends, just being together is enough. It's more important than whatever it is that you're doing. Invite someone to watch the game with you. Start a series on Netflix and only watch it with that person. Establish a rhythm of meeting with a friend every few weeks. Talk with your spouse and trade off an hour or two every week so that they can go be a friend. Plan vacations with your family friends and then invite others to join you. Do the work. I have some great friends that do this. My friends Brandon, Kara, and Amanda, they're so great at this. They invite me to do almost everything with them, even when I have nothing to do with what they're doing. They're all teachers and educators and Willard. But these friends include me in the group chat and they say, the door or the seat in the car is open, Garrett, come join us. So who are you doing your life with? Who are you doing side by side with? The third part of putting in the work is to eat around a table. This shouldn't be hard to comprehend, right? Eating is such a community-forming activity that Christ charged us to remember him through food when we gather. We do this every week. We just did it with Rodney, who's in Brazil. I don't have time to do a deep dive on this, so here are some references. We're going to put those up on the screen for you. If you were taking notes, write them down. Read your Bible on your own time and, and see that God cares about eating together. He always has. It's always been a part of his plan. And some of my single friends had a lot to say about this one. My friend Molly told me that being invited into homes of people, some who are married, some with kids, some not, has really blessed her in establishing those close friendships. Being invited to be a part of their holiday celebrations when she can't make it home has been great too. People who have done this for me that are married are my friends Paige and David, Buffington. They've always included me. Their marriage didn't end my friendship. They said, come over for dinner. 
my friend Kaylee Morgan, who is ministering in New York City, she said this when I asked for advice. She said, I would challenge them and ask them, who are they inviting into their homes? The most vulnerable place and center place of their lives. If people coming in and out of our homes are all the same, that's a problem. Jesus wasn't just hanging out with one type of person. He was with sinners, tax collectors, women, children, and so on. So we all have to eat every day. So why not occasionally eat with other people and be friends? Why not also grow our heart for people not like us by inviting someone different from us into our house? Or as you go out to eat, invite someone to come along. Drew Hunter's final piece for putting in the work is this, encouraging from the heart. Some of you guys, you don't have close friends because you don't encourage them. Now, listen, women are not exempt from this, but when I think of this and the people who have a problem with this, I think of men specifically because when men are friends, we like to make fun of each other a lot. And don't get me wrong, like, this is really funny. Like, this is one of the best parts of being friends with guys is making fun of them. But, like, Nick and I make plenty of jokes, but it's not at the expense of being kind. And the same is true for Micah. There's a, there's a difference between calling each other out on something and trying to outdo each other in demolishing our self-esteem. Those are not the same things. And if you find yourself always in a competition with your friends about who can be the funniest or the most sharp, then you're probably not a good friend. Friendship is not a competition. If someone seems to say more about you than they do to you, then they probably aren't a great friend of yours. Proverbs 18.21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death. Drew Hunter calls encouragement and friendship relational oxygen. It has been the honest, loving words of my closest guy friends that have helped me believe that God can still use me even when I screw up. Because they didn't write me off or try and shut me down with a funny quip. I have been able to unburden myself to them. And this church has a middle school minister right now because my friends have encouraged me when I needed it. And in the same way that being consistently grateful is a habit that we all need to work on and being thankful, we have to build that and be formed by that and grow in that, so is being an encouragement to our friends. One of my friends who is single that I asked to speak into this told me about the one friend she has who is her God talk friend. She was lucky enough to find this person when they were young kids and as they grew up, so too did their ability to encourage each other spiritually. But you can't have those God talk moments unless there's a foundation of care and encouragement, trusting that instead of someone judging us, they're just gonna love us. And we need to normalize affection and encouragement in our friendships, which I know Wayne spelled out a few weeks ago when he talked about David and Jonathan. But if you struggle to encourage your friends because it feels weird, you are the problem, not encouragement. Laughing with our friends is the easy part. But being there when they're crying or falling down, it takes work. So cultivating friendship takes wisdom and it takes work. And lastly, there's a third part, which is the act of pulling weeds. Pulling weeds in our friendship may sound like something that has to do mostly with other people. And, and maybe we have some pretty terrible friends and honestly, you need to uproot that friendship, okay? I, I've had to do that before. It's, it's tough, it's hard, but you can do that. Sometimes that's the case. But in reality, the biggest problem of our friendships is most often has to do with our own actions. One of the weeds in our friendships is simply us being inconsiderate. Proverbs 25, 20 says, like one who takes away a garment on a cold day or like vinegar poured on a wound is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Uh, the story this made me think of was about my mom. So I warned her that this was coming, so no worries. But my mom always used to sing that song like, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. Okay, apparently it's an old person song. Um, I've never heard the real song, just my mom sing it to me. And like, sometimes she was right. Like I needed to get over myself. I needed to think about what was good. But if she happened to sing that song too soon, oh man, like all it did was make me furious, right? And was what she said wrong? Not necessarily. But what made it unhelpful sometimes was the timing. And I know I've been guilty of this too, pouring vinegar on a wound by trying to move on too quickly or make someone laugh or trying to make them see the good before they're ready to. The same can be said for when we try and be too cheery. Some of you guys are the worst about this, okay? I'm just, I love you, but too cheery and energetic before the day's really begun, okay? I just came from camp and there's those people and then there's the rest of us. 
And uh, if you know me, you know that like I have nothing to give you before I've had a cup of coffee and been awake for at least an hour. I have nothing. All right. And you can ask Kevin Punch about this. We share an offer. And when he comes in and tries to connect with me a little too early, he can show you the bite marks. Okay. (laughs) But Proverbs 27, 14, it does say this. If anyone loudly blesses their neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. It's biblical. (laughs) I'm just being biblical, right? So we need to weed out our bad timing and be thoughtful with our friends, but we also need to weed out relational strife. Um, I don't have a ton of time to go into this, but you're probably familiar with Proverbs 27, 17, which says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And some, like Hobby Lobby's made a lot of money out of that. That's great. That's not what, it doesn't actually mean a good thing. It's like metal pounding metal. It's violent. It's kind of like, um, instead of like sharpening each other, it's kind of like poking someone till they're ready to attack you. Literally, the translation is you're sharpening the face of another man. And in Proverbs, when the parts of the face are sharp, they're like daggers, like swords. They're not good, right? So if you have this as a tattoo, I'm so sorry. That's not what it means, but it's okay. Like we can still work through it. We can talk out a decision point if you need to. But today, what this looks like, we call sarcasm. Don't you guys have that friend that can't get through a single sentence without trying to be funny or harsh at someone else's expense? In middle school, we call this person a bully. And as an adult, we call them sarcastic, which is a nicer word for other words we could call them, right? Don't get me wrong. I love a well-placed sarcastic comment, but too much of it or incorrectly placed sarcasm is not a friendship builder. It's an invitation to fight. Incessant sarcasm is not a personality trait. It's more like death by a thousand cuts. Every line by itself is just a paper cut, but eventually your insult, it'll hit an artery and that will kill your friendship. The third weed is that of gossip. Gossip will choke out the trust in our friends. Eugene Peterson summarized Proverbs 26, 20 this way in the message. He said, when you run out of wood, the fire goes out. When the gossip ends, the quarrel dies down. Sometimes the best thing we can do for our friends is just keep confidence, keep their trust. That means stop telling other people about your friend's hurt. If they didn't ask you to share, don't do it. It's like destroying this strong tower with a whisper. Sometimes to cultivate deep friendships, we just need to shut up. So these weeds pop up in our friendships because we are selfish and self-centered people, right? It's the default in our broken world that we only operate out of the me-centered focus. But we will never be good friends if we only ever think of ourselves and how other people have wronged us. Drew Hunter sums up this chapter on cultivating friendship by saying, the best advice for cultivating friendship is not to find a better friend, but to become one. So be wise, put in the work, and root out the weeds in your friendships. But the secret to becoming good friends is also developing a posture of repentance. We must acknowledge and acknowledge it often that we are broken people, quick to look at our own imperfections rather than just seeing other people's. To be truly able to do this, we need the greatest friend. We need Jesus to remake us and renew us and we need to be side by side with him so that where we are going, um, that's where we're gonna focus in the next few weeks. Wayne is gonna take us through that and how we can do that better. But I hope, your phone's ringing. Uh, I hope, This series has been helpful to you guys like this book was eye-opening to me a few years ago. But can I get a little personal with you here? I'm almost out of time. Here's why I need us to be good at this because friendship is a godly love that can give purpose to those of us who are single. Those who don't fit the cultural model of how we're supposed to be. Those who are widowed, those who are divorced that we can find intimacy and be loved through friendship without a deep, meaningful friendship culture. We're telling single people that they're incomplete and there's not much we can do about it. But Jesus was not an incomplete man. He was a single dude in his 30s. He was fully God, fully man. That's what we believe. At the same time, fully God, fully man. So therefore, we must acknowledge that marriage or being a parent is not the fullness of being a human. But Jesus, something that he did have was close friends, deep, meaningful friendship that ended up changing the course of human history. 
He could, not, he could have changed the world in any way. He's God, he can do anything. He could have done it any way, but he chose to do it through friendship. It's not through a marriage or any children that he had that changed the world, it was his friends, his disciples. And that does not lessen the value of a godly marriage. It does not lessen the value of being a godly parent, but it elevates the value of friendship. God chose to change the world through a group of friends who were united by the most powerful commonality of all, Jesus Christ. So if you wanna be a good husband or a good wife, be a good friend. If you wanna be a good mom or dad, model good friendship for your children. If you wanna make disciples and lead others into knowing Christ, be a good friend. Jesus was, and that's how he started our church. If you want some prayer over your friendships, we'd love to see you in Decision Point. I'll be out there. If you're online, you can go to northsidechristianchurch.net slash decision and let us know if you need to speak with a minister. Maybe you wanna become part of this church. You wanna know more about what's happening here. But let's not leave this place content with surface level or shallow friendship. If Christian discipleship is friendship, like Dr. John Perkins says, then we must become better friends with Christ and with each other. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for sending the greatest friend to us, Jesus. God, I pray we would put in uh, the work, we would use wisdom, and that we would weed out things in our friendships so that we can change the world like you did. In your name we pray, amen.